Okay, hopefully that's on everybody's screen now. And as you can see, uh, my topic today is looking at this sort of tension between colonialism and community in the making of the post-colonial nuclear order. Uh, with a focus on the position of neutral non-aligned nations, which I may refer to as the N plus N, following the sort of terminology established by, um, uh, by Yoko and Pascal, uh, but also just for kind of a useful uh, shorthand. And I'm hoping to use these uh, neutral non-aligned nations to better understand a kind of central question about the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Now, the nuclear non-proliferation regime and the global nuclear order encompass more than just the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. But I think most scholars, and, and I imagine most people here with us today would agree that the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, really represents uh, the cornerstone as uh, U.S. Ambassador Thomas Graham once described it, uh, really inaugurating the global nuclear non-proliferation regime with which we've lived for now over 50 years. And debate about the NPT, I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear, is kind of falling along two lines. Uh, the first represents it as uh, what one delegate to the 18-nation Committee on Disarmament described as a Leonin Treaty, meaning the type of agreement that a lion strikes with the rest of the animal kingdom. Uh, this is also echoed by uh, uh, the Chinese Communist Party Premier Zhou Enlai, who described uh, the MPT as a turn, uh, an effort to turn non-nuclear countries into the protectorates of the superpowers and press forward with a new type of colonialism. And I think throughout my presentation, you're going to see these questions of colonialism, post-colonialism, and decolonization really at the fore of uh, the discourses put forward by both neutral and non-aligned nations, but also the superpowers. On the, um, you know, on the other hand, uh, there are many, especially those who see the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty as a kind of real fundamental, um, uh, indispensable piece of uh, international law and order, uh, global nuclear order, uh, that presents it as a kind of grand bargain. And this should be familiar for anybody who's who's had even a passing familiarity with the NPT, the notion, and, and here I have actually a quotation from the US ambassador to the United Nations, uh, more or less at the beginning of the final negotiations for the NPT, for a resolution to endorse or commend it, describing it as having three major purposes. And when you hear discussions of the grand bargain, these three purposes, uh, essentially to assure that control over nuclear weapons uh, will spread no further, that it will facilitate what Dwight D. Eisenhower had described as atoms for peace, access to peaceful uses of nuclear technology. And lastly, that it would provide a sort of foundation and forward momentum uh, for future negotiations for nuclear disarmament and uh, en route to general and complete disarmament. So my research questions, the ones that have been, that animate this presentation and uh, really kind of arise out of the book that Yoko mentioned earlier, Atomic Reaction, The Nuclear Revolution, and um, America's New Global Mission, uh, really have to do with why the particular, the specific version of the NPT uh, with 11 articles uh, was finalized in the summer of 1968. So understanding the NPT not just as, um, you know, it's three, these three purposes or as a kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, an imposition upon the rest of the world, but instead taking seriously the text of the treaty, uh, how it was drafted, how it was negotiated, how it opened for signature and eventually entered into force. And the explanation that I'm going to put forward across the rest of this presentation is that first, this is really built upon a foundation of hegemony, uh, American but also Soviet hegemony, in terms of security, markets, and voice. And so I'll return to that when we get to discussing sort of the final push for the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty at the United Nations First Committee in the late spring and early summer of 1968. Uh, second, uh, I think it's also clear from the historical record, and this is a record that's expanded considerably. I'm currently leading a project from uh, uh, under the auspices of the Carnegie Corporation of New York to further internationalize the source space. But, and this is where, um, you know, Melvin and Tomas, both members, and so maybe I'll get the benefit of the doubt 
uh, in their uh, uh, critical responses. But uh, I think they and many other people involved with the Nuclear Proliferation International History Project at the Wilson Center have just vastly expanded um, not just the source base from the United States, but now the Soviet Union from you know, pretty much every member of the 18 nation committee on disarmament and many other countries besides. So this is really wonderful for historians. We have a much more comprehensive view of the treaty negotiations. It's also quite a burden. And, you know, part of the reason I've been working on this book for going on a decade, I suppose, is trying to integrate all these various international perspectives, attitudes, behaviors, also include uh, non-governmental organizations, international organizations like the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency. It, it, part of what I've been attempting to do is just create a framework with which we can organize all of these many new pieces of information and insights about the treaty negotiations. So I think what I've taken away from my research is that the non-proliferation treaty represented, in fact, a grand bargain, but it was also uh, sort of built upon a foundation of uh, superpower nuclear superintendents. And I think what you see with the role played by neutral and non-aligned nations, both active and passive, is that uh, this sort of underlying dynamic of uh, trying to stabilize regional nuclear um, uh, uh, power balances was really at the heart of the consensus that eventually developed, eventually coalesced around the non-proliferation treaty. So uh, the neutral and non-aligned states were instrumental, I'd say, really central to the negotiation of the MPT. This was in part because there was a kind of creative tension between their search for equality in the post-colonial international society, but also for, as I previously mentioned, their search for, for order, in particular, uh, regional order. Um, Second, the creation and the activities of the 18 Nation Committee of Disarmament are absolutely uh, critical to this process. Uh, but nonetheless, we also need to be mindful of the power dynamics at play in Geneva uh, during these lengthy, and they were quite lengthy. I think at one point I added it up over 400 meetings of the ENDC uh, at which the NPT was, was discussed. And then lastly, I think, when we try to understand the, the sort of imprint left by N plus N nations, uh, we have to recognize that it wasn't necessarily equal. And at least from my attempts to reconstruct the treaty negotiation history, I think you see a real triumph of a particularly Latin American notion of sovereign equality and uh, uh, international kind of common security. Uh, and I'll talk about this a little more as we get into the, the meat of the treaty. So uh, for the rest of my time, the next 35 minutes or so, I'm gonna discuss uh, the Irish resolution, uh, which was really the, the origins of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. Uh, then I'll discuss how nuclear non-proliferation and proliferation uh, was kind of part of a, a more general collapse, breakdown of peaceful coexistence, Afro-Asian solidarity and the non-aligned movement more generally. So if we're going to really, you know, um, place at center stage the role of neutral and non-aligned nations, I think it's important to see that there's also an interactive dynamic here and that the sort of diffusion of nuclear power was also at the root of a kind of uh, decline and eventually collapse of peaceful coexistence principles. From there, I'll get into the ENDC. Uh, the kind of power dynamics at play there that ultimately gave us the treaty text that we now have. And then end by discussing sort of this final chapter at the United Nations First Committee, when the UNGA would ultimately commend the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, setting in chain its eventual opening for signature and entry into force. So the Irish Resolution, it's part of the reason I think I, I, I embrace this topic while doing my doctoral dissertation research. Uh, whenever you would read a history of nuclear nonproliferation, you'd read a history of the treaty, there would be this kind of throwaway line, a couple of sentences, maybe a paragraph at two most about the Irish resolution. 
um, as you know, the, the real kind of springboard for negotiations for a nuclear non-proliferation treaty. And I was kind of curious, uh, why did Ireland, this sort of uniquely post-colonial, liberal, democratic, uh, Western, European, um, but also with strong diasporic ties to the United States, the foremost, you know, uh, among the superpowers, the first among equals, you might say. Uh, why ever would it have been this, you know, small republic that would have proposed what became the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty? And I think it's, if we're going to talk about neutral and non-aligned, I mean, Ireland is in some ways um, representative of their role in, uh, as treaty architects. And in particular, this man here, Frank Aiken, who was uh, the foreign minister, uh, who had spent time in the IRA, in Sinn Féin, as his sort of uh, 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 entering into his kind of, uh, his political career, and who saw the United Nations as a sort of platform for small nations like Ireland uh, to pursue and achieve their policies and preferences in a post-colonial international order. And so for Frank Aiken, uh, the United Nations offered both a means of aggrandizing Ireland's importance, but also sort of uh, the last best hope to create forms of sustainable justice and order in a world that was really trying to deal with two things simultaneously. Uh, decolonization with the collapse of European empires in uh, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, even Latin America and the Cold War competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. So the Irish Resolution is proposed in September of 1958. Uh, and, and this is a case of like, it kind of blows me away in coverage of the Irish Resolution. I've never seen it mentioned that in the two months before that, there were two major world crises. The first occurs in the Middle East um, with the July Revolution in Iraq, the fall of the Hashemite dynasty. This precipitates uh, sort of joint Anglo-American interventions in Lebanon and Jordan, as well as some not so implicit Soviet threats and even kind of implicit nuclear threats. Uh, that for Aiken was really sort of symptomatic of the dangers of combining the Cold War with territorial disputes arising from decolonization. Almost simultaneously, just weeks later, you had the second Taiwan Straits crisis, where Mao Zedong, the People's Liberation Army, begins shelling these two tiny islands just offshore of the Chinese mainland. They're both claimed, they're claimed by both uh, the People's Republic of China and the uh, Republic of China on Taiwan. The, uh, you know, Western allies and uh, U.S. allies in the Pacific believe this is kind of a Sino-Soviet uh, strategy. Uh, we now know that this sort of happens unbeknownst to Nikita Khrushchev. He goes and visits Mao. They had a tumultuous relationship pretty much the day that Khrushchev uh, departs Beijing to return to Moscow. Uh, Mao authorizes this artillery shelling that goes on for a couple of months. It triggers a major U.S. response to the formation of the largest armada ever. Um, I think that's even up until the present to I figured if it's two or three aircraft carrier groups are dispatched to the Taiwan Straits. And it's, just, it's the worst nuclear crisis of the Cold War up until that point. It would take another, you know, five years before, four years before the Cuban Missile Crisis would eclipse it in terms of its intensity and severity. And it's in this context that Frank Aiken proposes what becomes known as his nuclear restriction uh, resolution at the United Nations. Uh, in essence, and I, I think it kind of boils down in this quotation, on um, the present circumstances, the, the assembly should recognize to certain powers the privileged status of being the only countries entitled to possess nuclear weapons, what we might call the nuclear club. These powers should undertake not to supply sub such weapons to any other country. I would appeal to them in God's name not to spread these weapons around the world. And so you can see, you know, the first difference with the NPT that's finalized in 1968. This is, it's really the nuclear weapon states that are foregrounded and an admonition not for them not to uh, uh, pass nuclear weapons or nuclear secrets along to non-nuclear weapon states. But the second difference is I think uh, how strongly Aiken emphasizes 
this kind of Pax Atomica, this kind of nuclear restriction uh, that would maintain the nuclear status quo as a means to an end, as part of a gradual evolution of world law under uh, the United Nations. Uh, as he puts it, a way to preserve a Pax Atomica, to preserve the superpower balance of terror, while we build a Pax Mundi, we build world peace under world law. Now, these are probably a little smaller than I would like them. Uh, the other context beyond the two, the twin crises in the Middle East and the Taiwan Straits, uh, was Aiken's proposal actually earlier that summer in 1958 for what he describes as areas of law. And these areas of law for him would be essentially the expansion of the writ of the United Nations. You can almost see it, see it as a kind of trusteeship uh, to parts of the world uh, where decolonization had bequeathed somewhat arbitrary, artificial uh, state boundaries, borders, and as a result where there were these regional tensions among uh, newly emancipa emancip emancipated states. So uh, the Arab-Israeli dispute is um, you know, among these, Kashmir, the Taiwan Straits, and, but also Central Europe and the status, the post-war status of Berlin. And Aiken is essentially proposing, uh, this is before his nuclear restriction proposal, this is earlier in the summer, uh, a, a sort of set of uh, principles for states within these regions. It's almost similar to a nuclear weapon-free zone, but with more uh, requirements for uh, the superpowers and the UN Security Council members to respect the territorial integrity, to essentially um, uh, renounce military intervention. You can see why this would emerge actually in the wake of the uh, Middle East crisis and the US and British interventions in Lebanon and Jordan. Uh, but also other things such as free commerce, free trade, free communications, the ability of individuals to cross borders um, and, and much more besides. So I think looking back at this areas of law, you know, one of those criterion is nonproliferation. And it's actually from this larger package that he extracts this one thread of non-acquisition and non-dissemination of uh, military, military nuclear technology. Uh, and I think returning that helps us to, to, to recognize nuclear nonproliferation from its very origins as part of a much larger effort to uh, create stability, to uh, enforce territorial sovereignty and non-intervention, in addition to uh, some modicum of control over the spread of nuclear weapons. Now, as I mentioned before, Part of Aiken's concern was that in the absence of either, say, a nuclear restriction agreement uh, or uh, broader norms and rules around uh, foreign interventions, that these flashpoints in Latin America, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East could, uh, you know, uh, many nuclear strategists describe this as catalytic war, I think that was Herman Kahn's term, uh, essentially give rise to a chain of events that could culminate in a third world war. That these flashpoints in Cuba, in Kashmir, in uh, Palestine, uh, because of the nature of the Cold War, had a sort of significance, an existential significance that really called for, uh, you know, um, a strong purposeful effort to enhance the power and the authority of the United Nations. So um, obviously the Iris Resolution is really a springboard for uh, the Treaty on the Nonproliferation of Nuclear Weapons. And part of the way in which this idea of a nuclear restriction gets, you know, one might say co-opted by the superpowers is the failure of peaceful coexistence uh, in the early 19, early and mid 1960s. And this is really going to have to do most of all with Mao Zedong's China. So we've already mentioned uh, Mao with reference to the second Taiwan Straits crisis, but uh, for many, including Aiken, uh, it was seen as a, um, a sort of a testament that Mao Zedong did not necessarily uh, adhere to a consensual view of nuclear deterrence. Uh, 
Uh, Mao was on record of stating that actually a nuclear, uh, a nuclear war might not be the worst thing. You know, uh, kind of reminiscent of Dr. Strangelove, sure, we might get our hair must. In this case, he's talking about 300 million Chinese dead as if it's just one, just one more step on the route to a communist utopia. You know, uh, only socialism would remain in the world in another half a century, the population would increase maybe by more than half. This very much, um, you know, flummoxes listeners, not only in uh, the United States and its allies, but, but also in the Soviet Union, other members of the socialist world, but in particular, the non-aligned movement. Uh, for the United States, you begin to see, it's particularly the Kennedy administration, ideas of uh, nuclear posture that would go beyond sort of the conventional uh, containment strong points of South Korea, uh, Central Europe, to include potentially even India, which of course is, is vehemently not aligned at this time. And for the Soviet Union, you see this kind of articulation of peaceful coexistence, this embrace of peaceful coexistence by Nikita Khrushchev as a way to justify uh, or potentially working with the United States in order to uh, contain increasingly China's regional and nuclear ambitions. And what's quite striking about peaceful coexistence is that it is uh, essentially uh, the Soviet Union's repurposing of non-aligned rhetoric of Afro-Asian solidaristic um, criteria. So the five principles of non-alignment that are espoused at the 1955 Bandung Conference, territorial integrity and sovereignty. We see this with Aiken's areas of law proposal. Mutual non-aggression, also in Aiken's areas of law proposal. Mutual non-interference in the internal affairs of very of, of different Afro-Asian states. So we can think of this in terms, this, you know, the, the major inspiration for these five principles are uh, Sino-Indian disputes over the status of Tibet. Uh, fourth, uh, equality and mutual benefit among Afro-Asian non-aligned states and last, last peaceful coexisting. So in essence, uh, a sort of belief that uh, war was no longer a means of resolving international differences. And what's quite striking about the Soviet embrace of, uh, embrace of post peaceful coexistence is that, I mean, it's occurring just as you have a nuclear crisis in Cuba in 1962, but simultaneously a regional crisis in the Himalayan highlands between India and China. And so, you know, in discussions of neutral and non-aligned states, India is the sort of first among equals in the non-aligned movement, in the Afro-Asian movement, and China, despite the fact that it is the People's Republic of China and governed by you know, a, a one-party state, continually tries to present itself as a member of the Afro-Asian movement, as at the very least a kind of cousin to the non-aligned movement. And the combination of the dispute over Tibet, the dispute um, that eventuates in the 1962 Sino-Indian border war, and then in addition, China's increasingly apparent search for a nuclear weapons capability is simply too much for the Afro-Asian and non-aligned movement to bear. Uh, when you get this sort of tensions, the nuclear tipped tensions between China and India by 1963, 1964, uh, the sort of coherence of peaceful coexistence outside of Soviet, Soviet rhetoric, the coherence of the non-aligned movement is really under uh, the greatest strain it's ever experienced. Uh, recently, Joseph Turigian of American University uh, has been kind enough to share a number of documents from uh, Russian archives. And one document that he shared with me was a conversation between the Indian charged affairs in Beijing with his Soviet counterpart, where he states uh, here in October of 1964, so this is a couple of weeks after China's first nuclear test, the explosion will primarily be used by Beijing to demonstrate their abilities in the eyes of Afro-Asian countries. And because Beijing was not going to acquire an ICBM capability anytime soon, it would, you know, I think estimates ranged from a decade to, you know, 20, 25 years. This is very much seen in terms of regional geopolitics. Uh, again, according to uh, Jacques Meta, uh, this is, uh, you know, first and foremost about 
uh, how these weapons can be used in Asia and will create a negative reaction in terms of political attitude for China and her neighbors, including, of course, India. And this was something that the superpowers understood. Uh, in the lead up to the negotiation of the Limited Test Ban Treaty in August of 1963, the so-called Moscow Treaty, uh, the United States uh, and its fledgling arms control and disarmament agency specify that a test ban treaty provides a means of marginalizing the People's Republic of China with its sort of nuclear um, heterodoxy. Uh, this is a quotation from a white paper uh, just before Avril Harriman embarked for Moscow to negotiate the treaty with Khrushchev. To exert pressure that might be effective with respect to the Chinese would require the cooperation of four groups, the United States, the Soviet Union, major US allies, and many of the key non-aligned countries. And I think for them, India was first and foremost among them. After the treaty is struck, you see in the sort of back and forth between the, so the Soviet and the Chinese Communist parties, this is very much kind of the rhetoric, uh, the uh, transgression, the Chinese trans transgression against the principles of peaceful coexistence. Uh, the Soviet stating that this is a treaty signed by, uh, sorry, this is the Chinese signed by three nuclear powers, right? It's an attempt to consolidate their nuclear monopoly. You can see the sort of Zhou Enlai's colonialism, you know, nuclear colonialism language. Uh, they're starting to try that out. Moscow, by contrast, right? In the atmosphere of this unanimous approval, you can count on the fingers of one hand those who venture openly to oppose the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear tests. And of course, they are insinuating the People's Republic of China. You can see the United, the US and Soviet sort of strategy here is really being one and the same, using the non-aligned states and their fear, especially Asian non-aligned and neutral states, fear of a nuclear armed China. Um, by far the most, you know, uh, at that time, the most populous and uh, the most, um, uh, what do you say, uh, with the greatest exper uh, experience of war. I mean, they had really gone toe to toe with the United States and Korea for three years and had not, um, uh, had not prevailed, but had not surrendered either, uh, was really beginning to open fissures uh, within the Afro-Asian and non-aligned movements. You can see this in conferences of the non-aligned states. So uh, the second conference in Cairo of that year, this is in September of 1964, so two months before the first Chinese test, at the behest of the Indian delegation, adopts non-proliferation, adopts, in essence, the Irish Resolution as a new principle of non-alignment. Um, the Cairo Declaration includes uh, this admonition that they were ready, quote, not to produce, acquire, or test any nuclear weapons. And China's sort of on-again, off-again affair with the non-aligned movement was really, this was really being called out by this language. So um, by the time you get to the fall of 1964 um, and the first Chinese nuclear test, you really see in the United States and the Soviet Union and in the broader non-aligned non movement, ostensibly led by still India's Jawaharlal Nehru, the embrace of nuclear nonproliferation of the Iris Resolution as an anti-Chinese measure. And you see this even in the Blue Ribbon Committee that LBJ, uh, President Lyndon Baines Johnson, puts together after the test. This fear um, that the spread of nuclear weapons would create a major trend of nuclear capabilities among the populous non-white nations of the Earth that would greatly strengthen their hand in attempting to obtain an ever greater share of the Earth's wealth and opportunity. So, you know, of course, foremost among these China, Indian, populous, non-white, there's a, certainly a racialist overtone here, but I think more than that, a kind of um, a way of painting global nuclear order as not just lessening the likelihood of nuclear war, I think that is present, but I think more directly, a means of consolidating or at the very least preserving power in existing hands. And those hands at this time for Washington included Moscow. And so I think you see a real kind of almost pivot point here in 1964 in the Cold War uh, that's been instigated by the first Chinese nuclear test. <laughs> 
So this brings us to the negotiation of the nu Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty that we have today. And that negotiation really takes part, uh, takes place in the 18 Nation Committee on Disarmament in Geneva. Uh, they meet in the council chambers at the Palais uh, de Nation, uh, the former headquarters of the League of Nations. And you see the membership here. Uh, it's a bit of an oddity. It's actually a bit of a misnomer or a misnumbering because uh, while it is the 18 Nation Committee, France sort of studiously declines to seat their delegation. Charles de Gaulle essentially states that uh, nuclear issues should only be negotiated by nuclear powers, uh, which in some ways is in sympathy or I suppose corresponds to the idea of a nuclear non-proliferation treaty, but in other ways uh, does not, in particular allowing non-nuclear weapon states, including which, you know, all of whom, or I suppose all neutral and non-aligned states are at this time non-nuclear, it would completely, you know, um, uh, disallow them from having a voice in global nuclear affairs. The NDC comes out of the failure of the 10 nation disarmament committee. I think for the superpowers, this was an effort to kind of balance one against the other a little bit while also paying heed to decolonization, the considerable expansion of the United Nations General Assembly in the 1960s. I forget the exact number, but it goes from, I think, around 75 or 80 states in 1960. By the time you get to 1968, you have 124. So uh, a number, particularly of African, Latin American, Middle Eastern, and Asian states joining the United Nations during that time. And when we think of the, the role played by the N plus N states, I think it's important to disaggregate that further. So the eight uh, neutral or non-aligned states on the ENDC include Brazil, Burma, Ethiopia, India, Mexico, Nigeria, Sweden, and the United Arab Republic, which was in essence uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser's Egypt uh, expanded uh, slightly to Syria and Yemen. But in fact, this sort of um, category hid sort of a number of different types of states that uh, in many ways could often belong to, to multiple different groups. So uh, among the set of eight, you have one major industrial exporter, that being Sweden, uh, which uh, Tomas knows more than anybody else. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, more from him about uh, the role they played, in particular under disarmament disarmament minister Alva Myrtle, who by all accounts was an absolute dynamo in, in Geneva. Uh, you have developing importers, so importers that were reliant upon uh, more advanced nuclear states, so states with more advanced nuclear industries. This includes Brazil, Burma, Ethiopia, India, Mexico, and Nigeria. So really the, the preponderance of the N plus N states on the NDC. Among their numbers, you have a number of rising regional powers, some uh, with nuclear aspirations, uh, actually most with nuclear aspirations, one without. So this includes Brazil, India, and Nigeria, uh, and, and Egypt, really Nigeria being the only one that didn't have, th that there weren't some concerns in Moscow and Washington that they could uh, acquire nuclear weapons in the next decade or so. And then a set of small powers, which really were somewhat at the mercy of their regional superiors and which did not have, you know, real prospects for nuclear weaponization in, in the near future, Burma, Ethiopia, and, and Mexico. And what's striking at the EMDC, and as I mentioned by 1964, there's a kind of common recognition in Moscow and Washington that despite their differences in Europe over the German question, the status of Berlin, an eventual peace treaty between the two Germanys that would include the two Germanys, uh, there was actually a lot of common cause for them in the wider world. So uh, the Soviet representative, the Soviet co-chairman, Semyon Sasadovkin, in a meeting with his American counterpart, William Foster, the head of ACTA, the Arms Control Disarmament Agency, explicitly states, right, that uh, if the superpowers, uh, um, you know, that the superpowers were being kind of played for fools by everyone from France, China, India, the United Arab Republic, even the German Democratic Republic, so allies and non-aligned states as well, and they were taking advantage of them. Uh, however, if, you know, 
quote, the United States and the, United, and the Soviet Union were to agree with each other, everyone else would have no choice but to fall in line. So you're beginning to see a sort of mm, convergence of US and Soviet attitudes. Uh, at the very least, the first glimpse that a kind of superpower condominium might be possible, and that it might, in fact, be in their interest. Now, uh, I've been able to do some like recently research in Soviet papers, so I'm particularly excited about uh, some of the uh, insights, some of the findings uh, there. And I think you know it's you need to be careful with the Soviet Union because their focus throughout the NPT project is West Germany, and I think that's something that's been well established by by scholars. Um, but I also think it doesn't quite tell the whole story. So for Moscow and the CCP in particular, there is a continual desire to wage a, a peace, a kind of a propaganda, propaganda say a peace campaign. This goes back all the way to Stalin and the aftermath of Hiroshima, and it continues in trying to portray the Soviet Union and you know fellow socialists and workers' parties as really at the forefront of peacemaking. And Vietnam for them, of course, is a really you know, lovely thing to beat the United States over the head with, but they're far less militaristic or militant about this than the People's Republic of China is. In part, this reflects their desire to increase their influence in the third world. This is really going to come to fruition in the 1970s to the detriment of what will eventually become superpower detente. But nonetheless, I think you see this kind of Europe first attitude. Uh, it, I believe Brezhnev in a meeting of the Central Committee, in fact, states that, you know, peace on the European continent is the most relevant as it affects the interest of not only our country, but the whole world. Uh, so I do think there's a sort of a, a, a primacy uh, placed on, on Europe, which is important to keep in mind. The United States, by contrast, much more expansive, more global interest, uh, you know, close allies in the Asia Pacific and the Middle East in Latin America. And so I think, you know, this is a little beyond the subject of our conversation today, but this sort of condominium between the United States and the Soviet Union is not necessarily a meeting of equals. And I think there's an argument to be made that the Soviet Union in embracing a non-proliferation treaty also to some extent legitimated and even was kind of fair, like free riding on American hegemony in the world at that time, economically in terms of enriched uranium and other advanced nuclear services, um, but also militarily and in terms of the nuclear balance. This is, of course, still an era of American nuclear superiority, and you're really not going to have a true parity between the two sides until the 1970s. And as a result of this, by the time you get to 19, um, gosh, I'm trying to remember when this quote is from, I believe it's you know 1967, uh, other members of the NDC are joking that the only things the Soviet and American co-chairmen aren't doing is holding hands. And I actually have some pictures that uh, William Foster's granddaughter, um, uh, granddaughter-in-law, I suppose, uh, had shared with me, Marsha Foster, that shows that in fact, the two were actually holding hands uh, in Geneva. And there's a real effort to kind of sideline the N plus N delegates at the ENDC, the, you know, the two co-chairmen, the Soviet and American, they meet separately from the rest of the plenary. Um, you know, much of the hard bargaining takes place there or you know, you know, in, in, in cases where they're really trying to get unstuck, like a big disagreement, it's between say, Andrei Gromyko, the Soviet foreign minister and Dean Rusk. This is the case in the, the fall of 1966, which is a whole nother story having to do with the uh, US midterm elections. And the neutral and non-aligned states are really trying to find ways of increasing their leverage and changing the frame of debate, uh, despite the fact they've kind of been locked out by the superpowers. So uh, you get uh, UNGA resolution 2028, uh, which lays out five cardinal principles, you know, avoidance of loopholes, uh, you know, rough equality between nuclear weapon and non-nuclear weapon states and acceptable balance of mutual responsibilities and obligations. Uh, make some contribution to nuclear disarmament and not just non-proliferation and nuclear weapon free zones, which uh, for which a negotiation in Latin America is then, you know, very much at full pace. But in Geneva itself, 
so in the Soviet documents, uh, as part of that, I was reading through some writings by Roland Timurbayev, who was at various times the either the number two or the number three man on the Soviet delegation. And there's this great, you know, I've, in my dissertation, in my book, I, I tell the story of how the United States and the Soviet Union come to an agreement over uh, international inspection. So what is now really vested in the International Atomic Energy Agency. But at the time, with the existence of Euratom, the, the European Atomic Energy Agency, um, there are these sort of competing inspection regimes. And the question is, you know, can you have Europeans inspecting themselves uh, who is going to watch the watchmen? The Soviets are not, you know, super happy with West Germans, um, you know, essentially regulating themselves. And so the story is that Roland Timurbayev and George Bunn, they go for a hike in the Alps and they come up with a sort of, um, uh, I suppose, compromise where the IAEA would inspect Euratom, which would inspect the European states. And I always thought it was a lovely story and it's presented in Timurbayev's book and George Bunn's memoirs. As, as actually sort of showing the role of trust and friendship and these personal relationships that came out. And then I was reading something else by Roland Timurbayev where he states the reason they were hiking in the Alps was to avoid all the neutral and non-aligned delegates. So the US and the Soviet sides, while they're in Geneva, in order to sort of keep, uh, keep control over the, 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 the trajectory, the course of negotiations, they're going for boat rides on Lake Geneva. They're going for hikes in the Alps. They're going to these small towns, small towns out of town, uh, small towns like outside of Geneva. And on one occasion, Tim Rabayev said, you know, they're there to have lunch, and they see one of the neutral uh, and non-aligned delegates, and they have to hide from him because they're afraid that they're they're going to realize that in fact they're kind of um, they've frozen them out of the negotiations. And that is more or less true for Articles One, Two, and Three. Those three articles. There is, there is some influence. So Timurbayev also goes on to state that Alva Myrtle, the Swedish uh, delegate, as well as the Egyptian delegate, uh, had made some really good points in the plenary. And so the superpowers did indeed heed and they were listening for potential solutions from the neutral and non-aligned states. I thought this was very striking. I think this is also partly a way for the Soviet Union to um, uh, sort of authority uh, to, to sort of lend more authority to their positions. Well, yeah, it needs to be universal. We can't have the Germans inspecting themselves. I mean, just look at what Alba Myrtle and, you know, Caleb said, you know, this is, this is broadly popular. So there's a certain amount of triangulation that's, that's going on. But there's also mutual learning. So the Treaty of Toledo Loco was negotiated around this time, and it includes for the first time in an international agreement, a role for the IAEA to play in inspections. And it's quite clear that the Soviet and American negotiators and their teams are learning from the Treaty of Toledo Loco. It, it serves as a template, uh, it terms as you know, something to learn, uh, it serves as something to learn from, and it also serves as a way to you know, justify their positions. And I think it's, it's clear that uh, you know, Article, um, Article 3 borrows quite a bit. I mean, you could say really the heart of our Article 3 was uh, uh, appropriated from the Latin Americans. And of course, Mexico plays a huge role and it's also on the, on the ENDC. Uh, so I'll talk more about them in a moment. So by the time you get to 1967, early 1967, you more or less have superpower agreement on Articles 1, 2, and 3. Uh, the non-acquisition, non-dissemination, and inspection articles. And 1967 is an incredibly, I mean, worrisome time. Uh, a lot's going on in the United States, of course, with the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. Vietnam continues to smolder. Uh, you have the Six Days War uh, in that summer, which really brings uh, tensions in the Middle East to a, to a breaking point. The Chinese test their first thermonuclear warhead, as well as their first warhead fitted for a ballistic missile. And I actually think the latter is more important than the former, but that's kind of another historical debate. And you have the finalization, as I mentioned, the Treaty of Toledo Loco, establishing a nuclear weapon free zone in Latin America and the Caribbean. I'm really spearheaded by this individual on the left, uh, the Mexican deputy foreign minister, Alfonso Garcia Robles. Now, with 
the superpowers more or less agreed on the first, second, and third articles. Dean Russ goes to LBJ and essentially says the game is now moving to the neutral and non-aligned states. So it's really this sort of period, relatively brief, about 18 months from February of 1967 to uh, June of 1968 that the N plus N uh, delegates have their sort of greatest influence over the course of negotiations. Um, Mexico, I, you know, I've written a book chapter about this. Uh, essentially, articles four, five, six, and seven are all proposed by the Mexican delegate Jorge Castaneda in, I believe, September of 1967. Uh, the Americans recognize it as such. They, they thank the Mexicans, in fact, for finding ways to sort of further delegitimate this treaty in the eyes of the neutrals and the, and the non-aligned states. Uh, Article 7, for instance, includes, you know, really uh, guarantee that nothing in this treaty would prohibit or impede the creation of nuclear weapon-free zones. Uh, and the Mexicans are also using this and the other Latin Americans as leverage. If you want us to sign up for the MPT, well, you know, the United States, Great Britain, uh, the Soviet Union, other nuclear weapon states need to sign uh, up for the Latin American nuclear weapon free zone. Sweden's Alba Myrtle is absolutely instrumental as well. Um, often the kind of conscious conscience of the ENDC um, for her, a conference of test ban treaty is, is really kind of the sine qua non of arms control and disarmament commit, commitments. She achieves sort of its inclusion in the, in the preamble, never quite manages to get it into the body of the treaty. But I think she also is responsible for, for probably the best description, the best classification of the arms control and disarmament commitments in Article 6. And she describes them as a promissory note. Okay. Uh, that they have more than just kind of a, um, uh, a hortatory um, significance, that in fact they represent a legal obligation uh, that future review conferences should take note of and enforce. How, then, how can we, the non-nuclear weapon states, be expected to enter into an interminable obligation to remain non-nuclear if the nuclear weapon states are engaged in an interminable nuclear escalation? And this would you know, ultimately culminate in her book, The Game of Disarmament, uh, which really excoriates the superpowers for their failure to do anything but cap their nuclear weapons, uh, their, their nuclear arms race by 1975. Uh, the ENDC actually never reaches a consensus on a draft nuclear weapon, uh, uh, draft nuclear uh, non-proliferation treaty. It's nonetheless passed along to the United Nations General Assembly in April of 1968, which really, you know, uh, sets off kind of a, a final free-for-all among the 124 members of the first committee uh, to uh, determine whether the treaty would be in, endorsed, commended, or dismissed entirely, whether uh, any kind of final amendments could be made to the treaty before it opened for signature. And we have from French and Soviet American uh, observers there, uh, you know, both members of the UN uh, delegations and missions, but also uh, you know, William Foster and other uh, arms control and disarmament officials, that really, because of the numbers in the UNGA, it was the Latin Americans and the Africans who held the balance. And so looking back through you know, the various cables and letters and telegrams and reports, that two months is more or less uh, taken up by U.S. and Soviet efforts to rally a commanding majority of African and Latin American states. This ultimately leads to, you know, a, a fairly commanding majority in the political com committee, 92 for, for against about, I think, 25 abstentions. Uh, in the UNGA plenary, you, that number goes up to 95 with 21 abstentions. And part of achieving this was uh, a set of kind of 11th hour revisions that were put forward by Gabriel Garcia Robles. Uh, this includes, so I, I don't have it in this list, but they changed the resolution to commend rather than endorse because many neutral and non-aligned states worried that endorse sort of presupposed that they would sign and ratify the treaty. And then in addition, Robles asked for a preambular reference to the prohibition on wars of aggression in the UN Charter, again, reminiscent of Aiken's areas of law, this kind of, this idea of non-interference, non-intervention. Uh, 
uh, to expand uh, Article 4 to include a right of access to scientific and technological information and the fullest possible exchange of that. The creation of an international peaceful nuclear explosive service, quote, as soon as possible. And then lastly, and I think most interestingly, in the Article 6 promissory note, uh, the inclusion of a call to end, quote, the manufacture and perfection of existing nuclear arsenals. And it's uh, the first three all make it into the treaty, the fourth one doesn't. And I've always been curious, you know, manufacture and perfection is, is in some ways almost a form of nuclear freeze. I had sort of assumed that both superpowers nixed it. it I just read yesterday in the Soviet documents, the Soviets were willing to go along with it. And it's the Americans who have, you know, uh, somewhat the lead in uh, nuclear technology and ballistic missile technology that are unwilling to include it. So for those of you who really like the sort of nitty gritty of, of, of NPT history, that was a, a neat little find yesterday. But ultimately, most neutral and non-aligned states can mend the NPT. And I think we can explain this in three ways. The first is that most of these states are small. Most of them just really don't have great prospects for building their own nuclear weapons. Uh, the Egyptian president on the first committee, Ismail Fahmy, endorses the NPT resolution, quote, under strong pressure from Moscow. And part of that pressure were assurances that Moscow would keep Israel non-nuclear. You see this as well in, you know, Tim Revayev talks about various other neutral and non-aligned countries that played uh, a really supporting role at the UNGA, Egypt, but also Afghanistan, Iraq, Sweden, Finland, Cameroon. I mean, these are all small nations that really had a lot uh, for whom the NPT would redound to their benefit. Uh, at least some possibility that the superpowers and nuclear weapon states would impede their regional, nearby regional powers from acquiring nuclear weapons. Second, you have an enhanced voice in international nuclear affairs. We see this in the ENDC. We see this in the UNGA uh, deliberations. I mean, there's a real opportunity here for neutral and non-aligned states to, at the very least, make their wishes known. And this is, of course, um, codified in the NPT with the quinquennial review conferences. And then lastly, you have access to nuclear markets. And this is true for commodity exporters. So Australia, South Africa, Ghana, Cameroon, Togo, the Homi, Niger, you could even include Canada and the United States, all of which had large um, holdings of uranium or thorium that they were hoping to sell on the global market. And then, and this is you know, something else that is sort of come clear looking at the US and the Soviet side, both of them are also selling enriched uranium without which many of the most modern reactors simply wouldn't work. And so this kind of monopoly in the enriched uranium market uh, also plays a role. If these states want to retain access, they have to sign the treaty. Okay, so I'm gonna end here knowing that I went about five minutes longer than I wanted to, um, which is probably a record for me, I know I tend to. Uh, and I just wanna leave us with this sort of idea. How, how does this change the way we think about the MPT? And you know, I think the, the argument or the interpretation that I'm trying to put forward is that the MPT did in fact represent a grand bargain. Part of taking the neutral and non-aligned states seriously is taking seriously the articles that they contributed to the NPT, which includes four, five, six, and seven, uh, also, you know, considerable alterations to the exit clause and entry into force. But there was another grand bargain that kind of went along with this, which were implicit and at times explicit promises from the superpowers to both allies and neutral and non-aligned nations to inhibit the nuclear ambition and, uh, sorry, ambitions of rising regional powers. So these would include West Germany, Israel, South Africa, India, Japan, and Brazil. And so I think when we talk about the MPT and we talk about you know, why it emerged when it did, we have to take seriously that many of these neutral and non-aligned nations were looking for superpower help to maintain a sort of regional power balance in their, in their neighborhoods. Okay, and with that I'll end and, and welcome any comments and criticisms from Tomas and Melvin. Thank you.